I'd like to welcome everybody for our first session of the conversation series this year. Our theme for the fall is scientific knowledge for the broader world, uh, and we are going to have a series once a month session where we're bringing in people that are doing innovative work that moves beyond the notion of science communication as something that scientists as experts do and are trying to really engage with audiences, publics, um, new audiences, new platforms, new ways. And we have starting off this semester, two of our homegrown groups, which we're very pleased to have. So Chuck Kozilek and Colin, Carla Moyer from Ask a Biologist, and Dina, and I'm not even gonna try it, Z <laughs> starts with a Z, <laughs> and Carolina Abood from the Embryo Project. Um, for those of you who are newer to ASU, Ask a Biologist is a program that Chuck started many years ago here when he was in School of Life Sciences with us, and even maybe even before that in the Department of Zoology. Um, <laughs> you have good, good history. Yep. Uh, and that is an outreach website, and he's done a num number of podcasts. And then Carla started... Well, not started, but she did her PhD here in Dale Bernardo's lab and got involved with Ask a Biologist in the later <coughs> years of her graduate program and is now the managing editor for that and is, is growing that to other Ask an Expert. So Ask an Anthropologist is up and Ask Earth and Space Sciences is coming. Uh, so lots of excitement there. And then <coughs> Dina is our current managing editor for the Embryo Project. So she's the one who has to actually take the articles and get them online, but she also has the outreach um, part, both the, the Twitter and the other social media, but the, the in-person events part of that project. And Carolina, for several years now, has been um, the instructor for the Embryo Project Encyclopedia. So the Embryo Project is an online resource with general audience articles, and many of those have come out of um, this seminar, which has been running for at least 10 years, um, where every semester there's a group of mm, 10 to 15-ish undergraduates, and they all write five essays, uh, and then this goes through a process of editing and posting, and uh, the graduate students in the program have I mean, I think we started with an idea and we gave it to them and said, make it happen. And it went a really nice work for the History of Science Society last year, and it's been a lot of fun. So we will let them introduce each of the projects, and then we will have a conversation. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having us over. Thank you for lunch. I'm looking to see no, here. Let me log in. Don't trust me, do you? So, uh, yeah, so, so I'm Charles Kozelik, uh, and I go back long enough that I know everybody that has gray hair in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ask a biologist, yes. Let's, let's just jump into this. This is a, Carla's timing right now. Said, we said we're going to do it in five minutes. So uh, we're going to do a snapshot of Ask a Biologist, but before we get there, I wanted to talk about two of the reasons. There are many reasons we do Ask a Biologist, but there are two of them. And you can see left and right here. One is the disconnect between what scientists, uh, you know, understand and quote unquote believe versus what the perception of the public is. And there you can see there's quite a disconnect that's going on. And for those of you that have been tracking the the issue of humans worsen climate change, and you see that 87 percent. This is a, an interesting thing because if you see what's published typically, you'll hear 98 percent, and that's 98 percent of all climate scientists believe that climate change is being caused, at least in part, by humans. And so that's why you see a slight difference between 87 and 98. Those details are often lost in things when you're doing translations or filtering. What we're talking about, the other problem here, which is that the readability of the articles we write is declining. So that means we're becoming more and more siloed so that we don't actually communicate to a very broad audience. That means someone's going to interpret your work unless you do it, and then that translation or that filtering 
whether they do it on purpose or not, errors can occur and there can be some problems. The uh, problem with the uh, press is that they have a tendency to want to sensationalize things, and we know it's caused problems with that. So, let's go on to Ask a Biologist. This is to give you a quick idea of some of the things that are up there. Uh, Ask a Biologist started uh, more than 20 years ago. In this room, for, the, so for those of you, anybody here that uh, wasn't, wasn't born before Google existed? Uh, you know, it's going to be that very soon. It's going to be the thing where they, they didn't, don't remember life before Google. Uh, so we have a significant amount of content. One of the things I'll call out is the 15 languages. Uh, this is not every piece is translated, but a significant amount. The two languages that have the most translation, French and Spanish. Uh, what is the reach? What's this footprint? This is one of the things I always talk about. How do you get your, your message out there? How do you communicate to the public? This is information from 2018. Over 15 million visitors. It's about 40,000 visitors a day. Over 7,000 classrooms. Measuring classrooms is any, but anything that's uh, any place that has a single location IP range that we had more than five accesses within one hour. We can say that's probably formal learning. That's the way you can find out the classrooms. And then we have, we're also spending a lot of time in the virtual world with virtual field trips. So the next question is, who uses it? And as you can see, and this is actually hot off the press, so to speak. We ran a, a survey using a tool called 4C. had a little button on the side that said, have a minute. And uh, people could go ahead and fill out the survey. We asked more than just the questions of, of uh, who they are. Um, we had over 1,100 responses. So we had a good sample size. We went back through, and we had to do some cleaning up because there were some duplicates that we could find because we could find the IP and the timing on it. So we cleaned that up, and we dropped down to around a little over 800 for the sample size. As you can see, a large segment are students. Of that, 20% of those are under the age of 12. We have middle school to high school, two-thirds, right? And the rest, the around 8%. <clears throat> will be uh, the higher education. But we also have parents, uh, lifelong learners, and teachers. And those are actual, actually, even though those numbers are small, they're really important because they are the ones that amplify it, a lot of the things we do. Another piece you'll notice is that where you have 48% uh, traffic global, 194 countries out of 90, 195. So what's the question? Which one isn't? Which one isn't there? <laughs> I'm waiting for 195 out of 195, but every year we lose, we always have one country out. 28, 2017 was North Korea. We had North Korea last year, <laughs> the Holy See. So the Vatican did not come visit us last year. They came the year before. So, you know, we'll see if we can get both North Korea and the Vatican in the same, in the same year. Uh, and then. Last but certainly not least is how do we do this? And uh, besides Carlos and the Biz Labs work, which is a ton of work that they're doing, this is where we leverage. The in-kind and the volunteer work is just priceless, truly priceless. So we have over 350 volunteers and people that are linked to us, whether they're scientists and trainees. Those are all linked to ASU. And we have over 100 that are external. Let me just make a note. These are actually our recurring volunteers. Right. So the number of actual volunteers we've yeah. had over time is much, much higher. Yeah, over time. <laughs> but I do say, once in Ask a Biologist, always in Ask a Biologist. <laughs> yeah. Carla, I said she drank the Kool Aid and made the shows. Uh, and then the writers are people like you in this room. Some of you have written for us, uh, some of you, I hope, will write for us. Uh, and. I know there are people in this room that I've asked personally to answer questions. We've been very helpful with that. And so that's a snapshot of Ask a Biologist. Good job on the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll hand it off. Yeah. Okay. OK, so like Karen said, we're from 
EP. Um, if you haven't heard of us, I don't know where you've been because we talk about ourselves all the time. Um, Karen got most of the main points because she knows all about us too. But we are a group of graduates and undergraduates who write publicly accessible articles about reproductive and developmental biology for um, our target range of anyone with a high school or undergrad education. But I mean, I post GP articles on people who are older than that or younger than that, so we get around. Um, and the really cool part about EP is that um, we do ask, or we con, undergraduates into coming to the writing seminar and really researching these topics and writing full, you know, collections of articles about them and really getting involved with the process. Um, and we can talk a little later if you guys want to about some of the interesting decisions that we have, as grad students and people who lead the project have had to make in order to um, make it a fun place for undergraduates to come work and also um, to help guide them through the process. But they do a great job and we get our pu articles published online and Dean is going to talk about how many people come to our site. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a snapshot of the front page of our site as it looks today. We reworked it a little bit, so now we're really excited to have the graphics here at the bottom on the front page, and we also have the essays and theses that are more opinionated or more significant works that some of our graduate students do, including the PhD dissertations that we will be publishing there. So currently, our site has over a thousand articles. We have many, many photographs, and we have graphics as well. So this is a snapshot of the cities that visit us every single year. So you can see that the lighter blue is the uh, fewer numbers and the darker blue are the higher numbers and also that corresponds to the size of the circle. So some of the hot spots are in the USA, clearly so in New York and in Los Angeles, but another big one is in London, UK, there is uh, one in Africa, Nigeria, India is very uh, active with us, and we have Malaysia and Thailand and um, Australia. So this is a lot of people that visit our site and see us every year. So in terms of the numbers, these are the numbers just for this year specifically, and I will show you the numbers for the previous years in the future slides. So from January 1st, 2019 to today, we have over a million viewers. And you can see the distribution from the countries that they come from, and these are just the top 10. And Yes, we have most people from the United States, but I think it's really exciting to know that even though our content is only in English so far, many other places visit us. And also, we can see some of the really popular articles, and I think the important thing here is to look at the number of users and the number of page views, because number of page views is almost 50% higher than the number of users that we have, which means that some of those users actually come back and read more of our articles. So that's really exciting. And um, some of our articles are really popular all the time. So for example, the ethics of designer babies and the developmental timeline of the alcohol-induced fetal syndrome. So yeah, this is, this is really exciting, even though we're not nearly as popular. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these are the numbers for the few of the past years. So you can see that we're growing. And in 2018, the entire year, we had a million and over 700,000 views, while up until today, we have a million and 500,000 views this year. So I, I'm sure that we will reach 2 million views a year really, really soon. So another really exciting thing is to look at when do people access our site, which gives us a little bit of an idea of who it is that access our site. You can see that in the summer, we always have a decline in every single year that we've uh, published articles. And that is likely because a lot of people use our articles as sources for their projects. And during the school months, especially during the busy school months, such as October and February, you can see that our numbers spike up. So a lot of people, we, don't, we didn't do the survey between who are the professors or the students or who else does this, but scholars in general use us. And that's really exciting. 
and we have been cited in different uh, publications before, so that's really exciting for us too. And I actually logged on to Google Scholar to search my name the other day, <laughs> and it was really funny because one of my articles has been cited two times now. Yes. 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 <laughs> so that was really, really fun. <laughs> and this is our social media. This is the snapshot of today also. So we have about 950 likes on Facebook, but over 1,000 followers on Twitter. So we try to be active as much as we can. We post uh, posts about new articles that we post on our site, but we also celebrate birthdays of significant people that we've published about or just important days in science. So <coughs> stay tuned and follow us. <laughs> That's it. Okay, yeah, it's question time now. <laughs> so we'd love to talk to you about all the stuff we told you or whatever we left out, because we left out a whole bunch. So if you want us to start the conversation, you can, but I think we got a hand. <laughs> Sound like a ringleader, it's great. I have three sim or two siblings and a dog, so there's not three me. Fair enough. Um, so you, you guys in particular publish on reproductive health issues and things that might be glossed as somewhat controversial, but I mean, so does Ask a Biologist. So could you talk about like what are the kind of ethical dimensions of publishing things for a broad audience that might engender controversy or like any other ways that you feel like you have to make kind of ethical decisions in the course of curating your sites? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and it's something we face almost every semester because our students love to talk about things that are happening right now and a lot of those things are <coughs> controversial. Uh, IVF or abortion care or other reproductive justice elements. Um, so we made a lot of those decisions before e the students even get to class because we don't want to be in class and have the students um, feel lost or out of touch or feel like they're the ones who have to decide the controversial elements. So in EP, we really like to go back to telling students that everything they write about has to be supported by objective fact. We're not a subjective um, publication. We don't say um, what we think. We don't advance evaluative claims. But at the same time, something that we struggle with and students have to grapple with, which is, I think is a great learning experience, is that even stating certain facts can advance a viewpoint. And EP does have a viewpoint. We're a liberal publication because we're run by people who believe in reproductive rights and that reproductive information should be out there for public consumption. So helping students navigate, you know, what is a fact that is true but also indicates to a public reader that this is the kind of thing that's new and they need to be paying attention and watch out for things like that. So that's definitely something we have to do with on a regular basis. I think another big part of that is that a lot of people go through the process of reading one article and editing it. So we have the first, the author, who tries to be as objective as the author possibly can be while being passionate about the subject and reading all the sources. Then we have the editor come into play, and the editor fact checks everything, but at the same time reads, and the editor is normally from a different uh, discipline than the author, so some things may read differently to the editor. And they may say, well, this sounds a little opinionated to me, let me double check that. Or they will leave comments for me and say, well, do you think we should change this? Do you think we should delete this? And then at that point, it's three people already looking at just one article. And since all of us are from different disciplines, I think that gives a pretty good viewpoint of how we try to keep everything objective. Yeah, we definitely need to, um, to adhere to just the facts. That's really what we try to stick to. But it's, it's a really interesting challenge sometimes when you're doing that, when you're trying to integrate a narrative style. So you have a story that you're telling that you're trying to engage them in, and yet you're trying to keep it unvoiced in that way. Um, so there is like a sort of a fine line that you walk, but we, we generally try to fo focus our narratives on something other than the main subject something that they can relate to better and then connect it back and that way we sort of avoid that problem and then just stick to the facts. Um, but also it is good to acknowledge um, that there is controversy in some cases because then you bring in readers who might, you know, be an anti-vaxxer or might be against abortion or whatever else and you're able to sort of recognize that they have valid feelings but also just introduce the facts and the science to them. I, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest differences between the Embryo Project and Ask a Biologist is 
we're so broad and we are so embedded into extremely young grade levels and uh, a lot of the teachers that don't have a really strong background. And so one of the interesting things is how do you get content in front of someone before they turn you off, right? So uh, I use the example that we you would unlikely hear us or have a title of a story that leads with evolution. It could be an all about evolution. And we'll use the word evolution there, but we're not going to lead with it because a lot of our audience wouldn't even start to read it. And that's a concern to me is that we want to make sure, as I was just saying earlier while we we're talking off the side, is we're trying to build a bigger choir rather than preach to the, exact, the existing choir. And that's, that's one of the biggest challenges there. Um, the uh, other piece, as Carla said, is we are storytellers. And if, if we be, were, were better storytellers, um, the Voyage of the Beagle, for example, you go back to that, that's a story, but you're learning. It's amazing how scientific literature has changed over time, and I will say, not for the better. <laughs> uh, and the detriment of that is we are excluding a, most of society, and you can see it showing up today because they're very doubtful <coughs> and skeptical of what is being communicated to them. And that's again because often the communication isn't coming from the scientists, and sometimes that's good because they're not good communicators. But it's also because then you have those filters. And it's not, I don't say that they're filters on purpose. This is that if a <coughs> journalist is writing about someone, they often don't get the nuances that are important, or they try to leave with some kind of a sensationalized title. And that's of concern to us as well. But we don't shy away. We, we have majority of the major six to seven hot topics are on or will be on Ask a Biologist. But for example, our story on climate change is called Wacky Weather and Crazy Climate. Right? We don't say, cli we don't say climate change in the title. So, right. so, so leading off that last comment, how, how do we as scientists learn how to write better stories that are digestible to the public, but at the same time not watering down the science. Because I know I've, I've submitted papers that they're just like, this is too common language. You're, you're, you're speaking too simply. And so how do we walk that line? Yeah, I think it's going to be a slow road. It, wasn't, it didn't happen overnight. With, we went from one extreme to the other. Uh, typically, you do what I did is when I first wrote my first piece with Doug Chandler many years ago. So he said, go look at the journals that you're going to be publishing in, and how do you write? You write the way they write, the, the other authors are written. Um, that's a problem. So you can start slowly. That means and it may not be the entire piece, but the abstracts are I'm seeing a, a little glimmer of hope that some abstracts are becoming a little bit more accessible than they used to be. The rest of this, the thing might draw, go right back into the typical dogma that you'd see from a, a, a scientist you know, as far as their, their area. But that's one place. Uh, and the other thing is I think you're going to have to lead the charge slowly but surely. You know, you're know, you just going to have to work through it. But good writing and good storytelling can be very precise. Uh, we're, not actually, we're not asking you to do bedtime stories. Like Carla's first, first thing she came to do with me, I said, you know, I, I need you to write a bedtime story about uh, the, the genomes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that, um, we're not asking that. But we are asking that you write things that are in a way that it makes it, uh, there's a narrative and there's a way for someone who's not a scientist to get through it. Some of the things we have that are natural barriers are the terminology and the jargon that we use. And that becomes a challenge. Uh, I've actually had the same exact experience where, especially after I was with Ask a Biologist for a while, I was really focusing on trying to make one of my articles that I was submitting to the journal very readable. And um, my advisor like checked me on it basically and was like, look, I understand you want to make everything clear, that's great, but you don't need to give a definition for what court is. Like everyone who's reading this should at least know what that is, right? So there are certain places where I think you can really work on still having the clarity that you would in a piece for the public, but then just pull back on a few things, use some of the jargon terms and figure out that like, okay, I'll take that and then step later. So just focus on the clarity of your You guys have thoughts well, so we don't do like journal articles, so some of our techniques may not be applicable if you're trying to publish in, you know, 
um, the New England Journal of Medicine. But in our sto uh, articles, we also like to tell stories. We found that that engages people and makes it more digestible. And one of our tricks is that we always ask students to put in people. So as scientists, we're sometimes trained to write lab reports where there's no people. <laughs> Something is just happening in the lab, um, which is a choice that science has made. And I think it has its uses. But when you're trying to communicate with people, sometimes that can be a little um, desensitized. Like, and I mean, I have skimmed over more than one scientific paper because I lost track of what was going on. So putting in actors, even if it's just like a general researcher who's doing the science, can help people imagine what's going on better and then make it more readable and more memorable for them. I think another sorry. I think another important point here is that there are different audiences for different places. So for example, Carolina mentioned the New England Journal of Medicine will have a significantly different audience than Ask Biologist and the Cambria Project. So things that are more specialized towards professionals, I think that's okay to keep it jargony. It's okay to keep it the way things have been written there so far. Maybe just take it down a little bit in terms of the jargon and always speak clearly. But you can still do that with simple writing and you can do that with complex writing. And then when you write for a broader audience and you know that that's a broader audience, then you can really explain it and be really simple there. I think also another thing as more of the social media progresses, if you publish an, uh, an article that's very full of jargon and it's there and it's not as accessible, you can explain it in your tweets. You can have a persona online that engages with the broader public if that's what you choose to do. So uh, what do you think about writing as, as a medium for these sorts of topics as opposed to like graphic videos or podcasts that are becoming like the hottest thing in the world? <laughs> I, I, I listen to one of my write in every morning. You know, like, They're all good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so okay, yeah. Uh, within science communication, there's sort of a shift <coughs> kind of around the turn of the century between sort of the old model that was more like expert to citizen um, writing and sort of writing in a very expert focused way toward really trying to embrace like what we could do with all of these new multimedia opportunities and really opening it up to be more interactive. So sort of, sort of moved, moved over to the interactive model. And I think that as much as we can push that is fantastic. Um, I think that there will always be a place for really good, solid, engaging writing. Um, but I do think that as much as we possibly can, when it fits, to use all of these other multimedia opportunities, it's fantastic. And even a step further, I'm really excited for how STEAM is becoming such a thing and how we can really engage a new group of people that maybe we've missed before, even with the interactive science focus, by combining science with art and bringing them as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think that... Uh, I think that it's, yeah, there's there's definitely more room for us to grow. We should do as much as we can, um, but there will always be a place for really solid writing. Yeah, science, technology, and arts. Adding art to the STEM, just in case. I didn't know. No, that's good. We should explain it, it, all yeah. the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I said STEAM. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yes, and, and what's in really interesting is you might have a vignette that comes out and captures something amazing. It's not only amazing to you as a scientist, but amazing and cool looking that you can get out into the media, whether it's through uh, you know, Instagram or <coughs> Facebook's got to die, but there are other vehicles that you get out there to, to, to push some of these things. Uh, I did want to mention one other possibility for you when we were talking just a little bit earlier. So there's a, we have a section on Ask About just called Plausibles and EdMed Edits. And that's your that's the me other mechanism for you, so that you don't have to you know if you're having trouble, you do want to get published. Don't don't change the way you write and not get published. That wouldn't be good. But you can also then on open access journals work with us, and you can actually do that primer. It allows you to tell that story. It actually links to your primary research article. That's a powerful tool. Oh yeah, and the one thing I also wanted to say about that is how do you do it? You practice and you do it by writing for for other groups that you're not used to. So don't just you know bang your head against the academic writing. Anyone's welcome to work with me or with the Embryo Project to try to focus on your clarity um, in something that will relate to what you're doing and will create on your CV. So, yeah, so how do you like, write posts or answer questions about topics where the science isn't settled? 
You tell them. Tell them. Yeah. 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 And then you give all the kind of points if you if they're bad. So some people are just you know wackadoodles. Mm -hmm. Don't like to give them too much of a voice. But if yeah. there's a two or three groups of scientists who have a view or are debating the question, it's fun to get people engaged with something that isn't settled. You be like, hey, this is a new thing that's going on. It's always fun to talk about new things because um, they might see it in the news or something like that. And then you can just lay it out. You can lay out the discussion. You can give. Um, you kind of have all the different actors in place. You have this voice and this. They're not characters per se, but you can make it so that it seems like more of an engagement on the page, um, which can really get people involved. Oh, I have a follow-up question. So what do we do if you've <coughs> written one post in the past, and then new research comes out that that was just what we call it? Oh, what do you do with We've updated <laughs> plenty of stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, but real quick, I wanted to get back into mm -hmm. your first question. Um, so there. I think that there's an issue with the basic way that we teach science in mm -hmm. that uh, we teach students that there are answers. Like as they're growing up from a young age, we basically say like, this is the answer to what you're learning. And so in a lot of cases, there, the, that base foundation that they're learning for how science works is not entirely true because there are a lot of things where there aren't answers or we're still figuring it out or we have to change it or whatever else. And so I think it's really great when we have these spaces where we can interact with people and let them know that there's no solid answer or nobody's looked at that yet or you know that there's so many questions still to be answered or still to be muddled through. I think it's a really important learning opportunity. To, to Chuck's point, well to a lot of these points, but to Chuck's point about we want to grow the choir and, and how do we do that with the Embryo Project where we have the articles that are authored we have people writing to the author, or they'll write to the embryo project sometimes, or they'll write to the authors, and that gives an opportunity to follow up and then tell them about other things too. So Carolina had one that I think is the most exciting, with one of the major abortion doctors in, in Colorado writing her and saying, I'm so excited about your articles on law, they're so balanced, they're so helpful, you know, I, I think they're just great. And I had a pro-life person writing to me and saying, I love the Embryo Project because the articles are so balanced. Can you tell me how to learn more about some things? So it's an opportunity then to send some sciencey things maybe, or some other more scholarly things, and it, it leads to some conversation that, that, can be, that can be very valuable. We've talked about how we can do something that will connect Embryo Project and Ask a Biologist, and we haven't quite gotten that yeah. done yet, but since there are different audiences and different choirs, and it would be great to pull them, you know, teach them more about each other. So I hope that we get back and figure that out soon. That's good. But yeah, that wasn't a question, that was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> question? Yeah. So, I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the sort of operation. So, you guys are in leadership positions, but there are lots and lots of people who are writing, and I'm assuming uncompensated, at least with money. So, how do you bring people into this um, network and have them actively engaged when they're volunteers? So... <coughs> It's kind of snowballed. Um, I, I'm going to give an example in this case, not necessarily about the primary writing, but the translations. It took more than 10 years to get the first translation on Ask Biology. Um, we tried software, but it's, anybody who's multilingual will understand exactly that this, that software doesn't do it yet, and it certainly doesn't do it when you're storytelling from one language to the other and retain that storytelling capability, uh, unless you want it humorous or fun, what you say. So uh, it, we weren't making any progress, and, it, and luckily uh, what broke the dam was uh, a fifth grade teacher in Columbia reached out and found uh, a story that we had on uh, pocket seeds and seed germination and asked if we had a Spanish version. I said, no, but we'd love to have one. She volunteered. Poor thing, it bless her heart. Because it was it was huge. I mean, it was massive with an experiment and lots of things. And she stuck with us with Excel spreadsheet and all those things. Now we're at 15 languages and More, I think so. 16 now. Yeah, it keeps changing. 
Uh, and, and, how, and I've posted, I think, 23 translations already this year. Wow. So, so the, the point about it is, it's, we're at a point now that it's not necessarily the tr trouble getting people to volunteer for us. Mm -hmm. It's We are now, I used to be the bottleneck, and then we had Carla come, and so we had less of a bottleneck and opened back up. And now we've gotten more volume again, so now we have this bottleneck that's <laughs> Um Yeah, but I, I think the, the thing that you have to realize is that while it's not monetarily compensated, there is a lot of compensation, essentially. So but, these, these people who are uh, working with us, one, often they have a personal drive that's being fed by this. They really want to help get science out there because they believe in helping people learn about the process. Um, they might be able to include us in their broader impacts on grants, which we've been very successful working with faculty on, or um, with grad students writing for you know, NSFGRPs and things like that. Um, being able to have a group that will basically work with you endlessly on drafts until something is ready to publish is almost unheard of, right? But I will go, like, I go through things with scientists, you know, six, seven rounds of edits before um, I say, okay, this is great. Like, let, we can get this up now and you can put it on your CV. Um, so I think that they're, they know how willing we are and they also realize that there is compensation for them um, they usually come out being like, wow, I learned so much about writing through this process. I know it was hellish going through seven edits, but um, so I think that there really is uh, a give and take on both sides. I think that's definitely true, especially with our writers and our editors, because most of our writers are undergraduate students that may be working towards their honors thesis, or graduate students that are working towards their master's thesis, or chapters of their dissertations. And contextualizing those articles specifically in the way that we do them, because we have law articles, we have people articles, we have literature articles, experiment articles, technology articles, organization articles, they really help people understand the little parts to all of their problems. So when they put all of that together in a cluster of articles during the semester, I think it really helps frame their questions, frame their research ideas, and be able to use that in the context of their thesis or dissertation. And also, um, we have a large audience, just like you do, and so because of that, students can see that their articles are actually being viewed. I actually had an author from 2014 reach out to us just last week, and she wanted to know how many times her articles have been accessed. From 2014, just a single article had been accessed over 50,000 times. So what that means is that 50,000 people have read this one article by this one person. And I think that it may not seem as significant while you're writing them, but as you go forward and you just look back on it, this is a really big part that we're doing. It's open access, everyone can read it, so I think it's really important. I think there's definitely a lot of contribution and definitely a lot of significance, even if it is not financial. Yeah, and yeah. which one? <laughs> yeah, 50,000 is pretty impressive. There. <laughs> it's one of the top. Um, it's the Joan Joan, I think, the mm -hmm. sexual reassignment. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, and to Carla's point um, about the endless help offered, which can be hard to find. <laughs> Um, we get very attached to our students, we don't want them to leave us, um, and we really like seeing them grow, so we will help them from draft one to draft many, um, <laughs> figure out how to write about things and get clear on not only writing structure, but also writing style, and to really understand um, how to take a project from, okay, I feel like I want to research this because it's interesting, to a full cluster of articles or even like an honors thesis um, about that topic. So getting that experience <laughs> of Learning how to take an idea into an actual thing that's polished and well done is, I think, really valuable. Um, when I took UV as a student, that helped me, and now I get to help other people do that. So I think there is definitely something you get from being involved, even though we don't pay. Absolutely. UP is the reason I'm here now. I'm in this grad program, and I just, I love this, and this has been a really big change in my life, and I'm sure that a lot of our students feel the same way. Embryo Project is like the autonomy to be a writer, an <laughs> undergraduate. So yeah, anybody who has the time to participate in it, um, it's like one of the few opportunities that you'll have in your career where you have a group of people sitting around actually helping you improve your writing. Um, you'll have articles on your CV that have DOIs that are like additional publications to whatever else you have. It's just been like a huge thing for me in my career. And now I'm a postdoc, right? And I did this as an undergraduate, so. 
So yeah, EP is awesome. I'm a fan. <laughs> Carla, you said something really important that maybe it's worth elaborating on a little bit more, but the broader impacts thing. So, and, and the question before, well, you're supposed to write your serious science and not mess around with this fluffy stuff. But in fact, you won't get funded by NSF and increasingly by other places and foundations if you can't explain what you're doing, but also if you can't show why it matters. And so maybe you could say something more about how writing, especially for Ask a Biologist, really involves getting at how it matters. I mean, the telling the story isn't just, oh, I know this cool story, but you have to connect it to why anybody would care, right? Right, right. and I think, you know, I, I kind of wish that students who are writing, um, or even faculty who are writing their grants, uh, would have to go through the practice of creating a narrative about their work before they did it, because then I think they would be better. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think that that process of learning how to tell a story of your own work uh, is so important to helping people realize why it's important. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what. I mean, our shameless plug is we have a class we teach <laughs> <laughs> uh, on this very topic. And one of the exercises early on is one of our students will know. Uh, is that uh, you actually break down, you have to do a you know, five minute, one minute, and 30 seconds about what you're, what, <coughs> two minute, one minute, and 30 seconds. And that's an interesting challenge. Uh, it, but about, your research. Yeah, about your research uh, and make it clear. Uh, that's, you, you don't need our class for that. Go, go home and try it. Try it on, try it on your, your, your nephews and nieces. I always say, you know, if the scientists think they really, they really know their topic, I say, well, if you can explain it to a fifth grader and they understand it and see the value in it, now you're good. <laughs> uh, if you can't do that, that's great. You'll be fine with your colleagues. But if you really want to communicate, that's that's the audience you're looking for. Yeah, we also have them write uh, bedtime stories focused on their work or other work. And I think I think this gets at one of the most important parts of this communication challenge in trying to communicate. The really important part is that. So as as scientists, we look at sort of this pyramid of information that we have that we're trying to. And to us, it's all important, right? Because it's all based on sort of a foundation and it's all connected to each other and everything else. But when you look at science communication, you essentially have to cut off like the top two to 10% and that's what you're focusing on. So you, you bring in some of the other stuff to explain background in certain cases, but you really have to be able to prioritize what is important in your work. And that's what we're trying to help other people see in writing grants in, in talking to people in you know your 30 second elevator conversation with Michael Crow. You know, um, and so I think that I think that this is really what what science communication and practicing it and being a part of it can be really helpful for uh, on the research side of your work. And the elevator is in Fulton, and actually really much faster than 30 <laughs> seconds. So but you can see Michael Crow. If, if, if he asks you a question, it's usually 10 seconds. And, <laughs> So both of you noted, noted how much international viewership you're getting. Um, and I'm not sure either of the projects was really imagined as something that would have that kind of global reach. And so I'm wondering, other than the translation, are there things that you've had that you have intentionally changed because you know it's a global audience? It's, actually, it's really good because it's a really great question. Because initially, I actually wrote a story on time traveling plants. I was talking to a, co a colleague, and uh, I was talking about seasons. Well, I grew up in summer, winter, fall, and spring. Yeah. And she said, well, what if they're in around the equator? I went, oh, I can't. <laughs> so you really have to think about globally when you write about these stories so that you're not very, you, don't, you bring in that entire audience. So that's one thing you have to put yourself in the place of don't be regional. Um, yeah, we also try to make sure that uh, we have our writers focus on understanding the different backgrounds and accessibility that different people have. So, um, uh, you know, I had a student who was writing about uh, the, having a pool in your backyard, and I was like, that's a very selective audience. <laughs> like, why don't we take a step back and realize that, you know, a very small percentage of the people who read this article are going to have a pool or, or know what it's like to be a family that could even consider having a pool part of it. Um, and so we really try to uh, make sure that we're, we're taking into consideration um, 
sort of the world as a whole and, and where people are in their lives and where, you know, whether it's the environments that they're experiencing or the challenges that they experience. Um, and I think that that really helps make sure that each of our stories are more relatable to a broader audience. At NAP, um, we have specific uh, prose techniques that we use. So our students don't use like euphemisms or idioms because they don't translate well um, to people who didn't have English as their first language. So when we write about people, at the end of the article, the last line is how the person died or when they died. And <laughs> our students get a kick out of this, but we say, you have to say, they died. They died, D-I-E-D. -E. <laughs> um, <laughs> students like to be more compassionate. They say they passed away, they passed on, and that's... That's hard language to parse for someone like passed away where, um, from someone who didn't speak English as their first language. Most people will probably get the dying part, but um, other idioms or pave the way um, is a, something that students like to talk about because a lot of our people did big things in scientific fields, but paving the way can sound very literal um, to someone who isn't a native English speaker. So like, what are they paving? The <laughs> image of like cobblestones. <laughs> Um, shows up, so we try to clear that from our language um, to make it as accessible reading-wise for people as possible. I think another interesting thing about that is that I am not a native English speaker, so a lot of these things, as Lexi will know that she edits for us, I make a comment and I say, this sounds weird, or I don't understand what this means. And then if I don't understand what this means, then it is likely that a lot of other people <laughs> won't understand what something means. So we try to rework that. But also we have a lot of articles that are not necessarily region specific, but are about other countries. So we're not only writing about experiments of people in the United States. We have, uh, we have, we have articles about European scientists. We have articles about scientists in Russia and Asia and all these other places. And I think we have a cluster of articles about midwifery in China or something, something similar. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, a lot of um, articles are about maybe people from Europe or the US who go into other countries to research problems. Um, so you saw on the map that a bunch of people from India get views. We've had a bunch, uh, some students write clusters on um, the state of reproductive health in India since it's um, not as openly talked about. It's rather heavily there. Um, so they talk about um, authors from India who write um, accessible books about menstruation for young girls to read in India um, and various countries like that. So we try to have a, a more global viewpoint. Um, it's hard sometimes if we don't have students from those regions because then you necessarily get a skewed viewpoint because we are from the US, um, which is something we would like to work on, but we do talk about places that are from the US. Hi, I'm Lexi. Um, I'm curious what the broader impacts of both of these projects are, particularly within our community, and I, I define community mostly as in like the Tempe community, the ASU community, but also the university community. Have there been other projects that have sought or reached out to you guys to emulate either one? Um, a little bit more familiar on the EP side, <laughs> but um, I don't know if, I, I mean these are pretty like innovative ideas, number one of innovation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would assume that someone would probably be reaching out and saying, hey, how can we do this here? Or is it more of, hey, how can I participate? Lots of participation. Some partnerships, like Public Library of Science mm -hmm. is a partnership. Um, there are projects, for example, the uh, Center, uh, Center for the Arts did some work there because they're with some work we've been uh, doing bees. And Arizona Science Center. Arizona Science Center. Oh yeah, I, I had an NIH grant that was a part of that. That was huge. It was Body Depot. There's a whole section inside Ask about it. it's called Body Depot. It's a really big area there. Um, and it, it's interesting because it took me many years. The person that was the lead PI on that at the Science Center, um, I would I keep talking to her about Ask a Biologist. <laughs> she was writing this. She said, I, "I need to talk to you because we, what what could we do?" And so the whole idea was. They have a real strong focus and people that come to the Science Center, and they do have some outreach where they go into classrooms. But if you want to build that bigger footprint, how do you take some of those activities and translate them into a format that then can be used globally? So a good example is we have one on the uh, immune system, how it works. And in the Science Center, it's actually a stage, and the kid, and children put on costumes, and they act out the immune system. Right? 
So what did we do is we took that and we translated that into a comic book so that you can read the comic book and learn about the immune system. We have a luxury that they don't have because then we can have behind the scenes so you can learn it at that level and then you have the button on, online you can click and delete, direct, directly go into some deeper science. In the actual printed version, you actually in the back it says behind the scenes and it talks about it. So those are the kinds of things when we talk about broader impacts is how do you take something that was designed one for one vehicle, high touch, one on one, one to a few, uh, one to ma many, but to one to millions. That's the interesting challenge for us. Uh, the Pocket C Viewer, for example, is distributed to all the fifth graders in the UK, all fifth grade classes. Uh, that was that was a little bit of a surprise to us. It's just that they submitted to let us know that they were using it, and they said it would be 100,000 a year. And I thought, I said that was a typo when I wrote back, because it must be a typo. <laughs> it's blind, explain how it was going to be used. Um, yeah, and then I think a really important interaction that we have uh, which is used, I think, more in local. We get a lot of questions from local school. Mm -hmm. like, but is our question and answer, so the namesake of our site is a question and answer um, feature where students can write in questions and we um, delegate them and get them to scientists who are working in that area and that. And um, often this is also uh, blossomed into relationships with teachers um, who are using our, our materials and we'll ask them for feedback and testing. Um, so we have a lot, a lot of different ways that we're sort of embedded. Um, and then, you know, as Karen mentioned in the intro, we're also spreading the model. So Ask an Anthropologist launched in 2016, and then in the next month, hopefully we'll be launching Ask an Earth and Space Scientist as well. So there are a lot of groups at ASU that are interested in, in you know, sort of getting on board. And yeah, Michael Crow is now drinking Kool-Aid. Oh yeah, drinking Kool-Aid. He's, he's <laughs> on the, um, an interesting thing is it actually became, we think of it as we've had students that have worked with Ask About Us and gotten jobs, not only because of Ask About Us, but it was a, they would write to us and let us know, but look, that was really important for when they applied, they, the, the, the companies they went to work for were really impressed, and that was one of the things that felt got them out the door. Interestingly enough, today I just had another occurrence. I have someone that works for me that actually taught in the middle school and used Ask a Biologist. And he now is at ASU and runs the, uh, the digital portfolio program. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And Jake the student. And Jake, Jake the student. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to Jake the student, but uh, I also have someone that wanted to be a mentor, wants me to mentor him through UTL. Another teacher from Texas that has used Ask a Biologist, not didn't come in this year, but still, nonetheless, it was really important. In that. And then the other piece, I've always said to my wife, I was always hoping that someday someone would knock on my door and said, I came to ASU because of X, right? Well, we didn't quite get that. But we've been trying to get into the, the CC, the School of Earth and Space Science Exploration, for years. And we could not penetrate that wall, <laughs> you know. Couldn't get in there to, to do an Ask a Channel, because it wasn't really their idea. So what we had is, a, we didn't know, it was a Trojan horse. <laughs> so we had Chris Sheehan, the, the one I talked about, one of his students who used Ask the Biologist is a, a Barrett scholar and in CC. He wanted to do ask, an Ask. And, and he, he got he, a small internal grant to start it up. Oh, and, yeah. then, and then we got CC to buy it after that. So. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. How many of those Ask a Blank sites are there? So we're, we're working on the third right now. Okay, so there's an Ask a Biologist, Ask an Anthropologist, and... Ask an Earth and Space Scientist. There's also an Ask an Astronomer. So those are owned by, I think, there are ones out there that yeah. are not ASU. There, okay. There the is genre, another Ask a Biologist, actually. There is a genre of Ask a. <laughs> okay, because I'm like, was this the first one, or like, is this been like an existing, like, how big of a network? There was Ask thing? Dr. Universe, <laughs> there was Ask, uh, ask a Scientist, Ask a biologist. All we almost all started well, 19, 1997, 1998. Like the first batch. The first that. batch. Uh, the ten years later, the group brilliantly came up with the idea of ask a biologist in the UK. <laughs> ten years after, but uh, they've actually they no longer do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are ASCAs out there. Uh, HHMI, at, at the ASCA scientists, they actually stopped using it generally as well. Uh, we found it, I found it really interesting. And the ASCA part 
if you look at the overall portfolio, is not nearly as big as when and as as key as far as time commitment as the other pieces are. But it's so important for our feedback mechanism. Because on our site, you can send us feedback, you can send us um, uh, questions, and you can send us um, suggestions or something in there. We hardly ever get feedback, except that they find a typo or something. <laughs> which, is, which is great, because not that we had to typo, but, but they let us know and fix it. But uh, what's wonderful is on the question one, is it becomes a feedback mechanism for us because they have an expectation they're going to get something back by giving us something. And so we've written, certainly taught questions and some of our stories based on the kinds of questions we've got. So we'll get a lot of questions right now about marine life we have for years, and we don't have a lot of solid information on it, so we're working on it. Um, because we know that they're out there looking for that, and they want it badly enough that they will write us about it. So we're trying to create and fill that space. So it's sort of a good way for us to gauge what people are looking for that we don't have. Um, have you considered writing articles on like, how to actually use these articles in the classroom? So maybe like a meta perspective, sort of, of like this would be a successful way to do this, or if this is how to implement this. So for us, we have four teachers pages on a lot of our stuff, where um, especially if they're activities. Um, or if we have a whole genre of, like a whole uh, category of items, we might sometimes write for teachers how to use them in general. Um, but that's sort of, that's sort of what we do about that. But the meta, meta article is not a good idea. Back to the question about video and things like that, we also, so Ask a Biologist minus my, my ASU, which has got a huge audience, obviously, because it's internal and requires a lot of work. And, uh, and student study at CWDU. If you talk about an external facing, uh, non academic focused uh, site, it's the most visited site at ASU. Um, our YouTube channel is one of the most visited sites, YouTube channel. If you didn't realize this, by the way, YouTube is the second most used search engine out there. So you're, you're, I think you're leaning toward into the idea of where is it. To, where should you go on some of these things? Uh, so YouTube is another place, and so Carla has it on our list to do uh, how to use Ask a Biologist type of thing. So along those lines, that's great. All right. Did we do, did we do? Well, we are reaching the end of the hour, so thank you to you all for coming. Um, yeah. Thanks for having us. Start to the series. Okay. Um, and. Thank you.